Good morning, Southside. Welcome to any visitors who've come to worship our God together with us. We're grateful to have you. Uh, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 12, we are currently studying through this book as a church. Uh, God is just overwhelming my heart and the beauty of the community of God's people, the church, where the fulfillment of the law of love is to be worked out. It's otherworldly and it puts the glory of God on display and it's what we just witnessed from our dear sister. This morning we're going to wrap up this section and we're going to let uh, it start in verse 9, let your love be without hypocrisy. By true and genuine love, we're to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And we saw last week, we're to be devoted in prayer together. So as I've been just praying and studying Romans 12, I'm just seeing that this gospel, that is the mercies of God in Christ Jesus, it, it opens us up. It, it opens up your heart to God to offer up your body a living sacrifice to him. It opens up your mind to, to think rightly about God and how to think about each other and Jesus Christ in this world. It opens up our service. We're given the gifts of God in us to build each other up. It opens up our humility because this is all from him and for his glory so that now we can move into the needs of this body. It opens up our love Genuine, unhypocritical love. It opens up a diligence. It opens up a, a hope that is certain and steadfast. It opens up persevering in tribulation. It opens up our lips to be devoted to God in prayer. And this morning, it opens up our hands to give. It opens up our homes to hospitality. The gospel of Jesus Christ opens us up, and if I had to describe an unbeliever, it closes everything up. It closes your heart, it closes your, your giving, it closes anything, just closed up. And the gospel of Jesus Christ opens us up to what we've been made to be image bearers of our God. That's why we need a therefore. That's why we need a gospel that saves us and sets us free and makes us into these kind of peoples or we'll never open up in mercy till we drink the free mercy of God and Jesus Christ. True vital religion must be expressed. And so what a beautiful Lord's Day that we finish up this section on love and we come to the table with the only thing that can open us up and set us free to be these kind of people is the one who died a sacrificial death in our place on the cross. And so may we all be blessed this morning as we remember our blessed hope. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you for this section of what you've been teaching us. I thank you for the conformity to Jesus Christ that I'm watching all around me. I'm thanking you, God, that you're metamorphosing us from the inside to the out. And we're beginning to see more and more Christ-like behavior on every turn, and I just thank you for that sweet testimony of how you get that. God, you crush us. You bring us to weakness so that your strength would be made evident and would flow through us for your name's sake. God, pride dams up and blocks the grace of God. Would you break that in any heart this morning that's been all puffed up? As we look at the cross and remember, just melt it. Melt it till you're the only thing that we're looking at. God, I pray that you would do a mighty work in every heart here this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, come with me to Romans 12, verse 13. Contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. And so the saints, I want to begin this morning with, or to contribute to the needs of the saints. Who, who are the saints? It's not a football team. It's, it's not um, where I grew up. They, they were just a big deal. You prayed to them. You asked them for help. There was a saint for every need that you could possibly have. 
I have a brother who's a salesman at a car dealership, and he helps me whenever my kids would wreck a car. I could go in there and get one so they know me by name when I walk in there. And the, the salesman's name is Dennis, and he tells me that he and my brother are just the best, most religious people who've ever lived. And they know every day who is the saint of the day. They, they joke with each other, you know, who's the saint of the day? Uh, the reverence for the saints were very big. And when I, when I told him, I said, you know, if you believed in Jesus Christ, you could be Saint Dennis. And I said, I'm Saint Kenneth, would love to meet you. And I always feel like lightning's going to hit when I say that, but it, it's true. I am a saint. And so the saints are any who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it means set apart ones, set apart for God. Holy are you, holy ones. The righteousness that makes me a saint is Jesus. It's not my great doings that will make me a saint. It's his great doing. And the good news is that you can be a saint this morning. If you walked in, it could be St. Jordan. <laughs> uh, who else, man? St. Royce. You, you could be a saint, but you believe in Jesus Christ. St. John. This is a call to contribute to the needs of all the saints, all believers, it's in the plural, all saints. We care about every believer in Jesus Christ or family. And so this is the key, I think, to the whole section. It's not just special Christians who, who do things and get enshrined. A saint is anyone who believes in Jesus Christ for salvation and is joined to him. You now become the member of the body of Christ. Your family were interconnected in Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit. You're brought into the family of God. That is what draws our, our heart out to each other. We're, we're partakers of Jesus Christ. Look at each other that way. We're the redeemed of God. Our hearts have to go out to one another when you see that. We should contribute to the needs of the saints most freely. We're to model the, the freeness of the grace of God that just comes to me in abundance. It just flows like a river. Glorious is the grace of our God flowing. So we come in and we are one mind, one heart, one purpose. Our hearts go out to one another. We're brothers and sisters who are going to spend eternity together. You can't even spend an hour with each other, but you're going to do it for eternity? <laughs> Worshiping our Father and Jesus? Listen to how John puts it in 1 John 3. He said, we know that we've passed out of death into life. You know how you know you've been saved? Because we love the brethren. I don't, that'll, the minute you're joined to Jesus, you love the brethren. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that we're going to look at this morning, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The mercy of God, he laid down his life, and now we lay down our lives. But whoever has the world's goods, which is everyone in this room, and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue. That'll never get it done, but in deed and in truth. This is the call for the mutual support of one another, the engagement of what we have to help other people. When Cain sinned, he said to God, am I my brother's keeper? There had been this broken mutuality now in God's creation. And regeneration, the new birth, brings us back together. And the answer is, I am my brother's keeper. I care about every one of my blood-bought brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And so we are the saints. And we're to meet the needs. This word means need, lack, Necessities of life. The word for contribute is going to carry the idea of a material giving, but I, I think what Paul is emphasizing, I think it's just a little bit bigger than that. As I look at what Paul and in uh, and the context, how it's been used throughout the New Testament, we, we can't limit this to financial needs. This is any kind of need. Define it as anything that we lack for our spiritual growth and grace and our well-being. So spiritual need, physical need, any, any need 
contribute. Just listen to some scriptures. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 8. Therefore, don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. The needs of daily life and battling sins and all that I have, He knows them. In Acts 2.45, when the Spirit was poured out, they began selling their property and their possessions, and they were sharing them with everyone as anyone might have need. So as a need came, we're meeting them. That's what the Spirit does, and the Spirit redeemed people of God. In 1 Corinthians 12.21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't have need of you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I, I don't have need of you. We, we all need every member working together. Ephesians 4.28, let him who steals, steal no longer, but let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good for a purpose, in order that he may have something to share with him who is in need. I, I work so that I can have money to share with someone in need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, the need to, to not speak things that tear down and hurt and break, but to speak words that build up and grow in grace and edify. So my words look at needs and they bring comfort and healing and what you need through those words. <clears throat> Titus 3.14, let our people also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs that they may not be unfruitful. Let me meet the pressing needs. So catch this. We're all saints. That's what holds us together. Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. We're in the family of God. And as you've walked in this morning, there are so many needs in this body. Because of what God has done in our hearts in the gospel, he's given us a new heart. And by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we want to meet those needs. I just see him. My heart wants to meet those needs. Our hearts are given to this. Cold apathy just can't be. Quite simply, this cannot happen meeting for an hour and 15 minutes every Sunday or an hour and 30 minutes if my introduction is long. <laughs> it's got to be more than that. And, and I want you to hear this. I want you to repent this morning if church is just something that you go to and go home and you, you wait till next week. That can't be what God has designed this to be. Romans 12 has shown me, if anything, it's our life together. It's our life together, and as we join our lives and our hearts and our times and our hands together, we'll see the needs. They're, they're everywhere. You don't have to look very far, and the one thing I know in this world is that they don't care about my needs, but this body does. This body does. And this is probably the most important thing I've studied in a long time. What do you do with these needs? And Paul says, you contribute contributing to the needs of the saints. And just getting into the Greek, this Greek word, most of you probably have heard it if you've been in the church for very long. It's the word koinonia. And when you hear that word koinonia, I remember when I was first saved, I was in a church that they called their community groups koinonia groups. They're groups where we gather to share, to contribute, to participate, uh, to fellowship. And this word carries two main ideas. In 1 John 1, 3, he says, what we've seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship, that you might have koinonia with us through this gospel. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We're telling you this gospel because we want you to join us in koinonia. Come share Jesus Christ, participate, become one with us. We want your koinonia. Koinonia is devoted to a relationship. It's not so much an activity as a relationship. It's the idea of belonging to the body of Christ. And the second part is it means to share with, to give what we have to others. And so because we have a common life together in Christ, we share whatever we have with each other to meet each other's needs. All that I have is yours. I want to meet your needs with whatever it is. 
It's, whether it's through an encouragement in the word or financial help, whatever it is, that's what the Spirit of God does in a heart. So this word is so powerful that the Holy Spirit chose right here is we are to have koinonia in the needs of the saints. And I want you to catch this. This is bigger than saying you need to go meet the needs of the saints. Way bigger. It goes a whole step further. You're to enter into their needs. You just don't meet needs. You enter in to koinonia with them. We are co-laborers with them. We share, we actually have fellowship in their needs. We join in them. It's not, here's 20 bucks, go have a meal. Throw a verse at them and, and leave. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Have a good day. Flippantly say, I'll pray for you. And you're not devoted to prayer. There's something here that's so deep that breaks hypocritical love. It really cares. Hypocritical love does it to be noticed. Does it so get God's favor? There's a million reasons you can do it wrong. And there's one to do it right. The Holy Spirit causes my new heart to want to have koinonia with your needs. I want to enter in. This transcends worldly relationships. This doesn't exist on this earth. It exists in one place, the body of Christ. And it's going to, in a, in a few weeks, probably six weeks, it, it rejoices with those who rejoice. You literally can enter in and rejoice. You, you love your brothers. You're so one that when they're blessed, you're blessed instead of green with envy. And you, you weep, you, you weep with those who weep because you are one with them. It's as if I'm going through the trial. I, I'm so one with you. I hurt for what you're going through. It enters in. It loves the way that Jesus loved. It meets needs like our blessed head. It will even lay down its life to meet needs. I have a dear young man who, I guess he's not young anymore because he was young when I was his youth pastor. Now he's old. And he, when I met him, his mom and dad, his dad left and didn't want anything to do with him. And his, his mom was a lesbian. And his grandpa started bringing him to my youth group. And he got saved and we just bonded. And over the years, he's, he's got a heart condition and couldn't work. And this body did a lot to help him stay off the streets. And he finally had to, has to move back to California uh, with someone, a family member. And uh, it was, a, he needed to, he had, Five people coming to help him pack, and uh, they all bailed at the last second. And he can't do it because of his heart. And I couldn't make it that night. And I just gave Hunter a call. And, and the joy in this young man was, we got it. And he grabbed two other uh, young guys, and they came over, and the snowstorm was coming in that night. And they went over with such gladness. That was Koyania. And the message I got from him, he just was broken and weeping. How can someone who doesn't know me love me like this? I can tell you how. By the Holy Spirit giving you a heart like that. That's why we need a therefore. This is what justification by faith in Christ does to a heart. Because of what Christ has done, we share, we partake, we fellowship in the needs of one another. We, we have fellowship. We already learned this. We have fellowship in one another's graces. The, the graces that we have, we share with each other. The gifts that God has given, he says, you, you share with each other for the building up of the body of Christ. And now he says, we share in each other's needs. We, we also just have koinonia in the needs of the saints. We can't hoard our graces, we can't hoard our gifts, and we can't hoard our possessions. We are opened up. John Murray said, it is true that if we comply with this exhortation, we shall distribute and impart our possessions to meet the needs of the saints. 
But though this is implied as a consequence, the precise thought does not appear to be that of sharing with the saint, but that of participating in or sharing with the needs of the saints, joining in. The meaning, therefore, would be that we're to identify ourselves with the needs of the saints and make them our own. They just become our own. That doesn't exist in our world. And that's where the body of Christ can show Christ to the world. I love what happened when the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together, and they had all things in common, koinonia. And they began selling their property and their possessions, and they were sharing uh, them with anyone as they might have a need. And so just the spirits flowing, the hearts are opening up. Anything that I have, I give to the needs of the saints. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out in hearts. Hebrews 13, 16. Do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Proverbs 14, 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who is gracious to the needy honors him. I love Hebrews 6. For God's not unjust so as to forget your work and your love which you have shown toward his name. How did I show love to your name, Jesus? And having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. I, that's how I show it. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. He connects our koinonia, sharing in needs, loving with full assurance. So someone who's lost in needs, you know what they're usually full of? Assurance. Someone who just sits around and does nothing, you know what they're usually lacking? Assurance. He's just showing this connection when God changes a heart and it begins to go out toward the brethren. It brings assurance that something's changed in this little miser. Something's different in this heart. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich in glory, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Spiritually rich. I always talk about Charles Wesley, such a good example. He, he spent himself preaching the gospel, and he started orphanages and all kinds of ministries and it was said that he made 30 times more in a year than he needed to live on. And on his deathbed, he said, the executor of my estate is my hand. I gave it all away, serving and helping orphans till he died. Let us be open-hearted and open-handed to the saints. Christianity is not communism. It's not sell all our possessions and put them in a pool. It's stewardship. You have your possessions. But in love, if you need to give them, you will. And so this isn't communism. It's the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is to love God and love others. And that's what comes out of hearts. It's the law of liberty. I'm free to koinonia with the needs of the saints. That's otherworldly. And then I'm going to close out with a few thoughts on practicing hospitality. Uh, if you want a, a thorough teaching on it, go to two weeks ago where Peter Fan preached beautifully on hospitality. I just wanted to close this section with a few more thoughts. Uh, Alexander Strzok wrote a book, and he said, hospitality is the lost jewel of our life together. It's, it's the missing jewel of the life together in the church. Hospitality in the days of the apostles, there were few hotels and very expensive, yet a world that hated Christians. And the saints would open up their home at a moment's notice. Acts 9, Peter stayed with Simon many days. Acts 16, Lydia's first act after salvation, Paul and his men stayed at her house. 
Acts 18, Paul stayed in Titus Justice's house. They opened up their houses to one another. Missionaries went from house to house. The, the gospel literally spread by hospitality. And our houses are to be open, again, open up to show the love of Christ. It's not to be our hideout. America, the garage door opens in the morning and it closes and it, it just there's nothing. It, it, it's, it's not to be that. And I just want to exhort you as spring is coming and your neighbors start coming back out, get ready. Invite them in. Bring them for meals. This is, your, your, your home is home base. It's, it's a mission. And, and how do we use this for the kingdom? It's our mission center where we, we heal and we, we love and we minister and we bring people in. Young marrieds are tired of hearing me say a family is not a cul-de-sac. It's a, it's a conduit. It's, it's not, I just, me and my little family, it's, it's ministry. And I use it for the kingdom of God and advancing. This isn't just, here's a welcome mat. I don't know, some of you who are older like me, when, when you grew up, there used to be this little thing. If, if you were a kind person, you put a hand in your window. It was a little piece of paper with a, usually a white hand. And, you're, and my mom, bless her heart, I love you. She taught me, if you ever are in trouble, go to the house with the hand. And you'd go and, and they were ready to help you. So, it was just, so is this just a hand? Or is it bigger than that? I want you to catch something powerful. Next week... In verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That is the same Greek word in verse 13 for practicing. It's the word persecute. And when you persecute somebody, what do you do? You hunt them down. You're, you're going hard after somebody. And you're saying in this verse then, you ought to be hunting down people to open up your house to. Hunt, hunting them down, not, I got a little hand in my window. My door's always open. This is, this is persecuting people to get them into your house to show hospitality. <laughs> you're chasing people down to have them over. You're eager to share your home, your family, your food, your hearts, your gifts, your compassion. There's a million ways to do this without a home. You can do it at parks. You can do it uh, anywhere you want to go. I'm just telling you, it, it can be done anywhere. And it doesn't have to be, I don't have any money. You can do it without money. You can just come over for a tea. It just, it can be done. The only thing that's keeping us from it is what? Our hearts. And our hearts got to keep looking at the mercy of God and Jesus Christ, the one who invited me to his table freely to sit and sup and fellowship, to just keep staring at that until it opens up and I hunt people down to get into my home. I think I told you this. I, I, I talk all over the place and I forget anymore who I talk with. So if I already said this, someone raise their hand, so I'll stop. But Laura, Laura told me, she said, I don't see it in Romans 12, but I think my spiritual gift is cooking. And I, I cook uh, warm food that tastes good and it makes people want to come over. And when you sit and eat good food, you know what it does? It just opens up love, conversation, talk. So I, I think it should be in Romans 12. If you have the spiritual gift of cooking, <laughs> pass it on. Amen. Pass it on. I, my spiritual gift is eating. <laughs> so... So me and Laura are a perfect team. She cooks, I eat, uh, she's an introvert, I'm an extrovert, and I just can't wait to visit with all our guests, and she stays in the kitchen so she can cook and not have to do all that. And it just, we are a team. Don't let it bounce off, because I'm just gonna say clearly, this is God's word, not mine. Don't let it bounce off. If it's hurting, just take it. Say, hurt me, God, cut off the flesh, from my heart this morning that is keeping me from doing this. And it, it can be fear. There's so many things that could keep you from it this morning. And I'm just saying, look it in the face. Quit hiding it. Quit ignoring it. I'll deal with this another day. I want you to look it right in the face and say, God, you've shown me such hospitality. Will you turn me in this area and not let me stay apathetic and comfortable and not doing this? 
My home is my sanctuary. I get it. It's where I get away. But I want you to hear this. If that's all it is, it's not biblical. You do need time to refresh. You do need time for a family. But if you're preoccupied with this alone, you're hurting your soul and your families. It, it's just too much selfishness. What will they think of my housekeeping? You know, what will they think of my furnishings? Is my house clean enough? Am I a good enough cook? And, and I just say, be done with them. If you want to have me over, I don't care if there's dust everywhere. I will not notice. I just want, don't make that the issues. And when someone brings you a meal, if I hear you grumbling about that food, it, that gets my flesh like nothing else. <laughs> Receive love and give it and open homes and just be together because you're glad to be together and share and have koinonia in Jesus Christ. Are you with me? What are they going to think about my cooking? Just chicken soup. Get a Campbell's if you have to. It's not the food. And so I want you, I'm just going to give you a little challenge to plan once a month. To say, I'm going to have someone into my home and do something that I'm not used to. Or I'm going to meet someone at a restaurant after church. So I want you to just go before God and maybe plan once a month. Um, I'm not giving you a rule. For those who don't like rules, I'm giving a suggestion. Okay? This is a suggestion. And maybe once a month, a neighbor. A neighbor who you don't want to have over. Someone, a neighbor to get them in to your house. I want you to try that for a month. Alex Strzok again said, unless we open the doors of our home, the idea of a close-knit family as a church is just a theory and a myth. When Southside first started, anyone who was a visitor was invited every Sunday to a home for a meal. Resurrect that. Resurrect that. These doors can't be our only common doors. The doors of our homes must be open. It's not just hugs and handshakes, it's hospitality. Use our homes to show hospitality, not partiality. 1 John 1.5, Beloved, you're acting faithfully and whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they're strangers, and they bear witness to your love before the church, and you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, Jesus, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men that we may have fellow workers with the truth. And then Jesus said, don't let it be done with hypocrisy. Luke 14, 12. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and repayment come to you. Don't do that. That's hypocritical love. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. Your only motive is love, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Hallelujah. So just, I got to stop. <sighs> How are you doing at meeting people's needs? And I just want you to sit here before God and say, what's keeping you from giving to meet needs? Is it because you're oblivious and you've never been taught this? Just careless? Or are you greedy? I, I got to store up everything that I make for me. Or maybe fear that if I do that, I won't be able to take care of myself. And all these things, the gospel sets you free to be able to love and show hospitality. I had a, a friend of mine just recently who showed hospitality at a Super Bowl. He doesn't go to church here. But uh, I was talking with him and he said, you know, we, we had a big group and I didn't think about it. They all brought their kids. And by the end, they, they were all over the house. It was a mess. And he just went on to describe people stayed too long. And, he, and, and his conclusion was, we will never do that again. Hospitality has a cost. And I just want to talk to the children as we close out. I love our little children. Children, you have the ability to contribute to the needs of the saints. 
you can meet needs. Uh, la- last week, um, we had a visitor, and she had two little kids, and we were talking, and I'm like, where are your kids? And they're running around playing with all the other kids, having the best time of their life, and I'm like, they just met. We could learn a lot from the kids. And if you're saved as a, as a young kid, share the gospel with others. Maybe lead your siblings to Jesus Christ or a friend here at church. Be, be evangelists, youngins. Get, get after it. It's the love when the kids would go around all the doorbells handing out tracts. <laughs> need someone. Uh, a need is maybe someone being foolish. They're just zipping all over. Wouldn't it be great if just a young kid said, hey, Jimmy, don't run in the church. <laughs> Settle down. It could. With God, all things are possible. And this is what I really want you to get, though, is if your family is committed to hospitality, you can share your toys, share what you have. Maybe clean up the table if the adults are having some deep fellowship on Jesus. Come get all the dishes so they can stay focused. Talk with the children again about the things of God. So I just, I want the kids that you get the joy of, of um, hospitality and sharing as well. And so how do we break free into this kind of life? And the only way is Romans 1 through 11. And, and when you look into the face of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, you, you just can't close up. It, it, it just, it, it organically opens you up to people in needs. Jesus Christ came into this world and he died on a cross and he was buried and he was raised for our salvation. And he's coming again to make certain, hear this, if you trust in him, God will meet all of your needs in Christ Jesus. And he will be hospitable to you. And he'll invite you to his communion table this morning to come and fellowship with him together. You'll recline at his table. And if he didn't spare his own son, how will he not freely give us all things? Live into the fullness of that so that you can be free to give. This is very close to the center and the heart of Christianity. And so sorry if I messed with you this morning. If being a Christian is your creed or your doctrine and what you know and believe, uh, I'm stepping all over your toes this morning because that's not it. This is what the gospel of Jesus Christ does to a soul. It, it takes all that truth and it changes the heart and it opens it up and you begin to have koinonia with the saints and their needs and to use your homes as mission control center for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to go to the table and I'm just going to read one thing and we will come, uh, if the guys would begin to pass out the elements. And while you're doing that, as they're passing them out, I just want to remind you, this is an ordinance for believers. And so exercise oversight over your family. If you're a visitor and you don't know Jesus Christ, please come talk to me afterwards. I would love to share with you your hope of what he could do in your life this morning. Um, But I just want you to listen. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified where God looks at you now and declares you not guilty despite all your sin, they're removed at the cross and you sit here this morning justified. God himself looking at you going, you're you're just. You're, You're righteous before me. Justified as a gift. This is grace. It is a gift by his grace It is what he has done. He's he's giving it, not through your working, not through your merit. It is a gift of God, what he sent. It says, through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. He came into the world and he died on a cross for our sins. That's the grace of God. And he's offering you a gift, saying you could be justified. And the way you get this gift is by doing nothing, but looking away from you and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on that cross for you. God displayed him publicly as a propitiation that in his blood through faith. And so it drained the wrath of God for our sins. And so that 
is what now brings us to the table, and that's what causes us to have hospitality and contribute to the needs of the saints and live the life of Romans 12. So let's pray, and we will partake together. Father, I come before you, and I thank you for this gift. I thank you for what we remember now, Lord, the grace of God, that you had your son come and do what no human could do. You had him live the life that required perfect righteousness, and you put that as if we did it. And he died the death that we deserved. God, we thank you this morning that the wrath that was upon us is just gone. There's not one drop left upon us. He bore every last drop of that cup of wrath. God, let hearts be made glad and joyful now as we join shoulder to shoulder with like faith, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. God, melt away any um, division, any selfishness, any pride, and let us all stare at Jesus Christ as one with this blessed hope and the one who's coming soon. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.